Good morning, everyone. Yesterday at two something in the afternoon, Vernon called and he said, uh, guess what? <laughs> he probably was not going to be able to make it today. And uh, he said, could I fill in for his turn? And we do that. We swap back and forth um, for the three of us, uh, Ben or myself or, or Vernon, to change places. And we've always got something going. And uh, as soon as I got started, I realized this is Mother's Day weekend. <laughs> and so uh, I thought, why not? This would be a good topic. And we've got plenty of women here today. <laughs> so um, we want to talk about the women of the Bible. And uh, that's the title I had figured out about, to you know, hear about and, to, and think about. The women in the Bible. And uh, boy, there's more than we'd expect. Kind of shocks you when you uh, think of uh, most of the stories are told from a man's point of view. And uh, then you realize they all had wives. <laughs> and they, they didn't sit around doing nothing. They uh, helped in one way or another to uh, make the, the man's job easy for him or to see to it that he got to the meeting on time or... Uh, that he studied for the occasion that was being led and so on. So I thought, well, this would be a good thing to do. The Bible has at least 56 women in it. 56. And you think, well, and the men, let's see, uh, we better not count. Huh? <laughs> we know the Bible names of the books, or a man's title is his name. Um, but there was a woman behind every one of them. <laughs> <laughs> urging him on uh, and to make it work. Uh, it wouldn't work if there wasn't a, con um, a daily uh, communication, daily work going on. So uh, sometimes you run across things in little patches of what you'd like to remember. And so I've got a mixture of people's names, but also of uh, what they did. The women also often wore veils. And you think, well, when did they wear veils? And why did they wear veils? And then you run across um, somebody traveling across country and the women that were with them had to put on veils because there was a husband-to-be ahead of them. And they could see him coming and they quickly got their veils on. <laughs> okay. uh, there was a reason that they did wear veils. One interesting one that when you run across it, you think, well... What kind of authority did women have and how much under the thumb were they? Probably for a good reason, though, a good thing. God does things right, okay? Well, the women would make a vow. But if the husband heard it and said, that's not a good vow, that's not allowed. I refuse this vow to be heard. It was refused. If there was a, a fight over that, or if she insisted especially if they were uh, young girls that were not supposed to be doing something in a vow. The father could disallow the daughter's vows as well as his wife's vow. I think, wow, that's pretty bad. God knew something about men and women and behaviors and who's in charge of the home, um, who's supposed to say yes or no, who's going to do this or that. And sometimes the men made very bad vows too. And God honored them. And trouble happened because of it. There's always the good side and the bad side in any topic in the Bible. And we need to read the whole Bible in order to feel that and to understand it. To know what's going on. Who's in charge? And who at the end is God going to say, All right, Mr. So-and-so, what happened at your house? He's not going to say, Mrs. So-and-so, you're in trouble. The way I hear the scriptures, it's going to be the man, the head of the house, that's going to have to answer. Whoa. Anybody want that responsibility? I'd rather not. <laughs> you know. So we try to do our very best that when we see our maker and he asks us questions, that we'll be able to, to answer those things. That uh, is in the book of Numbers where uh, that challenge is about the vows. 
I won't give all of them, and I don't want to read them all. There's quite a few verses. Of course, if we're talking about 57 different women, 53 at least, different women, 56? Okay, I'll get there yet. <laughs> um, but women had part in everything, which was really interesting to check it out. I'll, I'll read a couple here probably in, in a moment. But uh, where the children needed to be in the meeting, it was compulsory for the children to be there. And the wives. Yeah. Yet it seemed like God was talking to the men and expecting the men to tell their household and to raise their children right and so on. But God knew that both were needed, husband and wife. If the wife refused the husband's leadership, guess what the kids would do? Same thing. Okay? And we all have had parents, fathers, that treated us maybe unkind or in difficult ways. And, and doesn't Paul talk about that? We got punishments from our parents or punishments from our father. And uh, we survived. <laughs> okay. God helped us live through it all. And one time when my dad was being particularly ornery and upset, whatever, um, I went to my mother wanting solace, I guess you call it. And um, I didn't know what my mother would tell me. And I didn't know if she was going to agree with me or agree with her husband, because that can make more trouble, right? She said, you got legs, don't you? Uh, oh, mom is telling me to get out of the way. She didn't say disobey dad. She said get out of the way. Well, when I found out about that, and found mom was really trying to help in a special kind of a way, when my dad would try to do something bad, I'd run. But I realized, too, that I only had to run about 20 feet. And my dad did not chase me. He did not force me to come back to take a punishment. Wow, different. So my mother's advice was really good. My dad and I had some good times together. He took me deer hunting and so on. We did things together. He taught me to use a rifle, um, the, the 22 rifle as well as a bigger rifle. And um, we, so we had some good times together uh, over the years and worked together in certain things. But there was mother helping out. When there was a worship service, I should have that scripture here handy, but I, it's somewhere else on my page. Uh, the women were required to be there along with their husbands. Required, not just suggested. They were required to be there. And then the children, naming specifically the daughter and the son, to be there. It's God's command. So while the message was going on about whatever was happening at the time, whether it was the laws of God or, or God's way of do, doing things for religious services, uh, they needed to be there. And they sang. Boy, the church would be dull if it was only the men singing. <laughs> we sure need the women to sing, right? And you have four parts of the music or more. Sometimes men do four parts. But they cannot go high. I mean, you can go about so high. I watched a lady, and uh, it seemingly was her son, but I guess it wasn't. But uh, there was another young man that could go just as high as she could. And the battle was on. You know, and they were singing a spiritual song, but she'd repeat it, and then he'd repeat it, and then she would repeat it, and then he would repeat it. And finally, they had to give up. You know, <laughs> the fellow wasn't going to be able to get any higher. You know, they quit before that happened. So women sang. And it's mentioned in, in the scriptures of their need to sing in the congregational singing as well as we know specials are great. Um, women uh, wore certain jewelries, and sometimes we, we get concerned about that. What kind of jewelry is appropriate? Sometimes it's, you know, men shouldn't wear wristwatches because it's a, a glitter or it's a... Um, Unnecessary jewelry. And uh, what's another word? Ornament. ornament. An ornament that somebody maybe shouldn't wear. Uh, I think that's stretching it too far. When you read in the scriptures of uh, offerings being needed for the temple, for building the temple, the gold, the silver, and so on, uh, 
who was giving it? If the women had a ring or a bracelet or earrings in, the, in their day, they gave it for the building of the temple or the ornaments that were needed for the temple to be dedicated to God. The women had those things, jewels, and they gave them. So there's Bible verses for many of those. Uh, the need for the tabernacle was in Exodus 35. Uh, bracelet, earrings, and rings, and tablets, and um, uh, all jewels of gold, and so on they gave. They also had mirrors. Now sometimes mankind uh, takes the Bible and think, well, it was shiny metal only. I believe man was a whole lot smarter than that to make things out of glass. Why would you wait? There's a trend in some religious circles that man knew nothing until 400 years after Christ. Come on. Did you read the Bible? When did they start making stringed instruments? Wooden instruments. They didn't just beat a drum. The fourth chapter of the Bible. Fourth chapter of Genesis. Yes, first book of the Bible. They were making musical instruments. And when they played for a king, of whatever, good king or bad king or evil king, they better all be in harmony. All those instruments were told what the names of the instruments were. I wanted to make that into a Sabbath school lesson or something because there's so many instruments named in the Bible. It's really interesting. Some were stringed, some were blown horns, some uh, like trumpets and sackbuts, and you know, you, you name all the instruments that that they had, and they all played together in harmony. Well, the king could get really upset, right? You don't bring that stuff in here. <laughs> um, yeah. So people did that. And the women did those things too. They played the instruments and, uh, and made the services work nicely. But the mirrors, uh, we know that they had glass. They had glass bottles. And they had other things that were made of glass. You know how you can tell too? When the oven was made seven times hotter than it's ever been, guess what happened to the sand? It became glass. <laughs> okay. No problems. They knew about that too. Okay. So uh, the women were required to attend the reading of the law. Very interesting. Maybe they didn't preach it, but they were supposed to know it. (laughs) So they were to be there in those meetings and to read it, understand it. That's in Deuteronomy 31 and Joshua 8. Um, They were required to attend. They did cooking. They spun. They did embroidery work, um, lots of different things that, that were going on in there. They, uh, uh, they made garments of cloth. They did gleanings in the field. They did orchard work and vineyard work. Um, it sounds almost, when you, when you read through uh, Aaron's clothing that he was supposed to wear, and you say, oh, just send a man to do that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you are sure. <laughs> I think the women were highly involved in what fits and what doesn't fit, how tall are they, how, what the body length was like, and what the shirt width had to be in the sleeves. And I'm sure that the women made a lot of clothing for the children and for the whole household. And the chapter that has the most about women it says in there that they made clothing <laughs> for the family. Okay. Uh, we know about their work in the orchards and vineyards because of the, uh, when you read of, uh, uh, when they're working in Boaz's fields and gleaning, as Esther was um, gleaning, um, you, you, you know that they were there. When uh, Moses went into the desert, and met up with his future father-in-law and a future wife. Uh, they were working with the animals, working with sheep and goats, and um, raising food for the family and cooking and, and working for them. Um, very easy to see that they were involved in watering the animals, 
lifting water uh, from the well in order to uh, feed the, the animals. Uh, just a number, and, and the same goes for uh, when uh, the, the servant went to get a wife for the son. Remember all that story? Uh, same thing with the, what the women were doing, where they were, what they did. Need to read those. They kept vineyards of their own in the Song of Solomon. They were allowed to own them and keep them, to operate them. Um, there's part of the verse there in uh, Songs of Solomon, verse uh, chapter 1, verse 6. They made me to keep the vineyards, but mine own vineyard have I not kept. Wow, the woman had some pressure on her, or a young lady, that had to work for the family's well-being. And her own, she owned it, it was hers. You know, we only to catch some of these little words as we go past them. She owned her own vineyard. She tended the flocks and the herds, uh, worked in the fields. Much of that you can, you can just grasp by reading through different chapters of the Bible and different stories in the Bible. And you really, where were the women? What were they doing? Uh, they wore ornaments in Isaiah 3. They were weaker than men. Uh, yes and no. You realize women can go to war. Women can build ships. You can build airplanes. Where does this weaker come in when it's a pickle jar? Okay. <laughs> There's certain things that we'd say, okay, get a man, you know, greater grip in your hands, something different. Um, wisdom? No, you're wrong there. Many women have a tremendous amount of wisdom. So that's not strength. Okay. So you, know, you can look these things up in the Bible and realize that they were there. Some had a job. Uh, the ladies were not allowed to be priests. They weren't counted in the Levi count, so they weren't preaching and so on. But watch what scriptures you're looking at as well. Who, who did what? Just a moment, we'll get to a few of them. Uh, I like this one. Women were doorkeepers. I thought my mother always wanted to be a doorkeeper. So I looked this one up yesterday again just to refresh my mind. But go with me to John, book of John. Uh, get the right one here. John 18 first. John chapter 18 and verse 16 and 17. So chapter 18, John 18, and then we're going to read 16 and 17. But Jesus called them unto him and said, Suffer the little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as one of the little ones, little children, shall in no wise enter the kingdom. That's part of the story that I had here, uh, and I realized when I read it that I needed more. So I started looking around. I said, oh, I did it the same thing. I read it last night in Luke instead of in John. Sorry, turn to John. <laughs> I read it last night in Luke as well. And then realized I've got to go to John 18. John chapter 18. John chapter 18. And I got a paper there. Now, I may need to back up on this a little bit because I've got um, uh, it's not 16 and 17. Maybe I put it on the second sheet because I did the same thing last night. I looked it up in the in uh, Luke. Why I did I don't know. Okay, let's try John. John 18, it may come to me. Uh, yes, yep, okay. Uh, in John 18, we're looking for a doorkeeper. So we, we see it would start, the paragraph would start at verse 15 with the disciple and that other disciple. Paul, uh, John never tells about himself. So that's a hidden idea that, yep, this was John that was relating this. 
and he was known by the high priest, and so the high priest would let him come and go. Uh, but in verse 16, but Peter stood at the door without. Probably two things. He wasn't sure he was allowed or he might get into trouble for being in there. But along came John. Then went out that other disciple, which was known to the high priest, and spake unto her that kept the door. Wouldn't there be a guard there? How strong was this woman? How, how tall was she? <laughs> what would she do to you if you didn't? You know? <laughs> okay. And brought in Peter. So he had to go past that lady that was in charge of the door. Then said the damsel. Now this is not a, a, you know, a big woman and a strong woman. This is a damsel, a young person. That kept the door unto Peter. Art thou... Uh, art not thou also one of this man's disciples? And he said unto her, I am not. And this, then the story goes on. Um, and he stood with the men that were warming themselves there. And then uh, again he was challenged and he denied the Lord again. I think the story of the door again uh, is just down a couple of verses and I don't want to read them all. Uh, No, let's see. I read too much last night and didn't write where I wanted to be. Peter denied again uh, in verse 27. No. Sometimes you have to read a long way down to catch exactly the same thing that there was a lady there that called him out, that kept the door. Uh, I maybe didn't stay with that idea or I looked in another book. But there was a, a, a lady, a damsel or a woman that kept the door and was the guard of the door. She you had to pass the approval, right? In verse 16, 17, 18, you had to have her permission to come in. And then he was able to go in. That was Peter was able to go in and warm himself with the other men that were there. Um, and then a new paragraph starts in verse 19 about the high priest. And I'm wondering if there is another place here or did it just maybe read it in one of the other passages. But I was amazed that the lady was in charge of the door and they had to uh, speak to her to get permission to go in. She was under authority. She probably had an answer to the high priest. Why did you let this one in? How did this one get here? And so on. So I probably read the rest of that chapter last night and uh, was amazed at the story that was there. But that's good reading. It's good thoughts to, to do that. Go on and read those things. Okay. So John was the right place. <laughs> But I turned to Luke. Okay. Um, I also wanted to try something else here. In uh, John 11, verse 2. Oh, the length of her hair. And John chapter 12, verse 23. And 1 Corinthians 11, 15. These are all verses about the hair length and the fact that they had hair that they could use and so on uh, for various things like wiping Jesus' feet. Hair was long enough that she could use it as a towel. That's amazing. Okay. Um, in Isaiah 3, women wore ornaments, first which they could give to the church's use or donate the, the money value. Um, in, uh, they were timid in Isaiah 19 and verse 16. Um, women were known to be timid because he said, uh, you guys are just... Too weak. You guys are not leading the, the church. You're not leading the army. You're not doing this. You're not doing that. You're like women. Are you going to leave it up to the women to be the leaders? And that was a scolding. That was not saying that the women were weak, but it's a scolding for a men to allow that to be there. Let the women have their place and let the men have their place and men should get on with it. Um, there's a comment of in Isaiah 
19 verse 16, the Egyptians, like women, are afraid. That was a scolding. And Jeremiah 50, verse 37, and Jeremiah 51, 30, the Chaldeans and Babylonians become like women. You're saying, you're not going to fight a battle with these women, or you're not going to be strong enough to lead out. Nehemiah 3, in verse 13, uh, the Nineveh people were like women, meaning they were afraid and fearful. Uh, you give the woman the right tools, a fighter plane, you know, <laughs> who's going to be afraid of who? It's been a known fact that in car driving, sometimes men will drive into the battle, crash into somebody else's car, and forcefully aim his car, where women would try to avoid the accident. Who's timid? Who's smart? Who's intelligent? <laughs> Got to think that one over a little bit. But men often would ram into the problem, and with airplanes and so on as well. Uh, there was a saying years ago about the uh, black people maybe wouldn't fight as hard as the white people, depending on what country you're from too, you know. But uh, they found out that the fighter pilots that defended the big, heavy weaponry airplanes, bombers, that the black people would fly closer and tighter so that the enemy could not get in. It was a big advantage to have a black person as a pilot that was protecting your airplane. Yeah, okay, so ne we never should get ourselves in a corner on some of those things. Women were affectionate. They were tender to their offsprings. They were uh, courteous to strangers, meaning foreigners. Women had a heart and, ca and could, could understand the plight of somebody else where men would just probably thunder on forward. If they were, uh, they were, uh, if they were virtuous, they were held in high esteem. Interesting. That's a good thing for women to think on and to to live like those kind of women. Um, they were fond of self-indulgence, like something that they could put on some clothing, and that's in Isaiah thirty-two. They liked ornaments in Isaiah, oh, no, Jeremiah chapter 2 and verse 32. Uh, they liked ornaments. They can be subtle and deceived, silly, easily led a, into air. Oh, so women have to be careful. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 6. Women had some bad traits and bad tendencies. We've all got our heirs where we have to fight them, right? Have to fight our heirs and fight our, our sins, our bad attitudes, bad ways. The better part about women, here we go. They were rulers, Isaiah 3, verse 12. As for my people, children are their oppressors and women rule over them. That's a scolding to the men. But the truth is, also that it's a, a positive on the women's side, right? That they were able to do it. They were able to lead. Deborah, find out about her life. Look her up and find out about her life. Athaliah <laughs> in uh, 2 Kings 11 and 2 Chronicles 22. But there's also people like the Queen of Sheba. You don't want to cut her slack. Candace, Queen of the Ethiopi Ethiopians in, in Acts chapter 8, 27. The Persian Queen in Nehemiah 2, verse 6. Women were patriotic. Miriam, Deborah, and others. Patriotic, and they helped defend places. Remember the woman that had the, the uh, grinding... A stone, and she threw it down from the tower and killed a guy. <laughs> she was defending her city. <laughs> okay, um, patriotic. They wrote poetry like Miriam and Deborah and Hannah and Elizabeth and Mary, 
They wrote, some of them wrote songs and so on. Um, so you want some good things, you know, uh, about what's going on with what women could do. Women could be prophets. Oh, I think never. Now, wait a minute, then you don't know the Bible. <laughs> They're not a normal thing, but you'd read of Miriam, which prophesied, Huldah, which prophesied, and you read in first, Second Kings, Second Kings 22, 13, and verse uh, 15, first part of 15, there was a college, a school, and and there was uh, quarters divided out and so on in Second Chronicles 34, 22 through 28, um, where these women were, were teaching others. Uh, prophetess uh, Noah Dai, uh, that's N-O-A-D-I-A-H, in Nehemiah chapter 6 and verse 14, there's Anna, Oh, remember when Jesus needed to be taken to the temple to be um, uh, prayed over? And uh, that's in Luke chapter 2, 36 through 38. Uh, Philip's daughters. Remember, Philip was one of those seven men that were filled with the Holy Spirit and were chosen men to do certain jobs. Well, Philip's daughters in Acts chapter 21, verse 9 says that they were prophets. Uh, Elijah was, the, was to prophesy against the daughters of the people which prophesied out of their own heart. So you got bad and good, right? If they were bad, we need to name it and say that they were bad. And that's in Ezekiel 13, verse 17. Women of the Bible were in business, as, uh, Proverbs 31. Yeah, they owned land. Do you remember the five daughters that had no inheritance because they didn't have a husband? And they had to make a special rule and bring it before Moses and so on to see how, and, and, uh, and Joshua, they had to bring it before them and say, what are we going to do with these women? And they got inheritance. They were allowed to own land. Somehow that got lost over a number of years, didn't it? Some parts of our country in the United States, women were not allowed to own land, sign for property or vote and so on. Somehow that got lost. They were able to sell real estate. Ruth chapter 4. Wow. <laughs> okay. Don't uh, take things too short because we're just modified by what some men thought about what women could do or couldn't do and whether they had the right to do it. Women were first at the sepulcher. Sure, they were first to sin, and Eve, but they were first at the sepulcher. And uh, they were last to leave when Jesus died on the cross and they were going to go to where Jesus was going to be put in the tomb. But the women were there, and then they, of course, saw where the uh, Savior would be in the tomb. Women were converted at the preaching of Paul. And I got one, two, three, four, five, six verses. I don't think we want to do that today, do we? Our lunch is getting warm. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, uh, the Greeks, there was women in the Greeks uh, culture and Greek country that accepted the Savior, and um, they, uh, not a few, it says. So many of the women accepted Paul's preaching and Timothy and so on that was with him. Thessalonica, the same thing, the Greeks and chief women were there accepting Savior. Uh, the Bereans that believed, and it says of honorable women, which were Greeks, it's right in the scriptures. That's uh, Acts 17, verse uh, 4 and 12 and 14. So you need to read verse seven, chapter 17, Acts 17. Uh, at Mars Hill, when uh, Paul preached about the, um, the uh, God that they were praying to, and he said, why are you doing that? I can tell you about the God that made this whole 
universe made all of this happen. And the verse there says, there were a certain man and a woman named Damaris, in verse 34. And find these women and find out what they were doing and what their names were. And he could go down a list on uh, Mary, for instance, the names of all the ladies that had the word Mary in their name. Uh, there was um, Mary and Martha and Dorcas and, Lu- and Lydia and Priscilla, Phoebe, uh, Julia, and Lois and Eunice and Rhoda. And, you, know, you need to find these women in the Bible. Mary Magdalene, Mary the uh, mother of Jesus. Don't forget Vasta, Vast, Vashti. Um, and in the Old Testament, she was queen. She got demoted, but she was queen. And then also there you'd find good people like Deborah, and Naomi, Ruth, and Hannah, Esther, so on, other people. So there's quite a few there that you could find, probably 25, 21 really good women. And others that were not named, like Job's wife, um, Haman's wife, the mother of Samson. Remember what she gave as good advice? Can't you find a woman amongst your own brethren? <laughs> and he scolded her, scold her son. And he said to his dad, probably, get that woman, I want her. Oops. <laughs> um, the lady that fed Elijah, the Shumanite woman who took care of Elisha, um, just various ones. Pilate's wife told Pilate, leave this man alone. I've had bad dreams over this situation. You need to leave him alone. Uh, Lot's wife and daughters, a woman that was taken in adultery and brought before Jesus. Potiphar's wife, Midianish woman in the camp of Israel the daughter of Herodias that asked for the head of John the Baptist. Good and bad examples, both. God puts those in the Bible for us to understand. And here's a few others. Eve. Let me forget Eve already so far. <laughs> Sarah, Hagar, Rebecca, Rachel, Leah, Dinah, Thomas, Zipporah, Midian, uh, Murian, Murian, and uh, Rahab, Delilah. Oh, there's there's more here. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. That I mentioned more women in the Bible. Sometimes we need to have a list made, kind of, of who they were, where they are, what what was their good traits. What did they do? The women were praying and doing something down by the river. Remember when Paul went and had church service with them? They were meeting there for church service. Women. Interesting. Very good. So I had a different list made at a different time, and I had all these ladies. All these ladies. So I've counted them there, and there's at least 56 women that are named or that they were part of it, like the Queen of Sheba or Queen of Persia or so on, that you couldn't get a name for, but they're in the Bible. So I guess what the idea is today when we're thinking about uh, discussing, mentioning the value of women, high value of women in the church services, how the church operates, what's done for the church, how things get done, uh, the writings, the transcribing, you name it, all kinds of things that are done by women's hand. So we thank you, women, for being there for the church and helping it to prosper and grow and to carry an office of high value but just don't often get a name for it. <laughs> May God bless you.